I've reached a point where it's finally time to come clean about who I really am. I'm in a relationship and I've got a loving family. Everything looks perfect, but it's not how it seems. When I was born, not even the doctors knew what lay hidden below the outer covering. Once my parents found out, it was many years before they revealed my secret to me. And I've pretty much kept it under wraps ever since. Well, until now, that is. I've got something to say. I'm going to get it off my chest. And that is that I've got this condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome, which means that I'm part male and I'm part female, and I'm a hermaphrodite. Our bodies straddle the divide. We're part god, part goddess. But that doesn't mean we've got both bits. Nowadays, we're known as people with intersex, or orchids, as we sometimes call each other. My kind has always been invisible, almost mythical. I'm on a journey to change that. I want to meet other people like me, and to get my own family to start talking after so many years of silence and secrets. Bonnie, my sister, is coming along and doing some of the camera work. We've been into filmmaking ever since our parents bought us our first video camera. I wanted to make this film for a long time and it has taken a long time to make it because it's just been little by little by little coming out and just talking about these things. but. Generally, I sort of feel like, like this is something I have to deal with on a daily basis and um, just maybe have the camera on my face for this bit. Okay. Um, oh, it's got a great shot. I'm not sure how making a film with my little sister is going to go. I call mum to ask if my parents want to tell their side of the story. I get the response I was hoping not to hear. But is it just because it's about this or is it just generally? That's okay, I mean, like, it's, it's fine. I just, I, I just have to admit that I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. I'm pretty horrified. Oh, like, I, like, I understand it. Like, of course, like, I would have been completely amazed if mum and dad had, had actually turned around and went, yes, of course, we'll go and be in this documentary. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know what it would take to change their mind, but I don't want to bully them either. Well, I sort of was expecting it anyway. But, you know, you have to break away from your parents eventually, really. <laughs> Do you want to get a shot of me putting the phone down? Yeah. What are you aiming to get out of this thing? because it doesn't seem to me like you've actually got a, got really an idea. You want them to, do the, to, to, do, to be in the documentary? I want them to be in the documentary. And they are. Now they are, right? Who knows what... There are, they are. This are might you, not end up in the documentary. You, they are. The fact that you rang them and the fact that you're doing this right now, what you're doing right now, that's the documentary. They're already in it. It's not like any of us can escape it. Here, Bonnie, put these on. No one can escape it, not even me. I feel like I'm the only one who really wants to make this film. It's not up to you to provoke your mother to respond to any of this because it's, that's very unfair, like on a person. It's unfair. Just for a film, like just for people, just for other people to see. The that's film it. is actually doing things that I've, I've never been brave enough to do on my own, to talk to my parents about on my own sort of thing, you know, because there are things that I've wanted to say but I've never said them because I didn't want to upset them or make them feel bad. But, you know, the thing is that they've been unsaid. I mean, at the end of the day, she'll probably be all right. She'll probably come around. You just, it's just today, like, it's just the first time you've ever really asked her to, to be in this thing, you know. The way your parents are, they'll, they'll eventually come around. They always do. They always say no to everything first and then they work it out and they, they're probably at home right now talking about it. I guess it may take a while for mum and dad to open up. 
I know they said no on the phone, but I'd try asking them face to face. Fuck you, love. <laughs> Look me out. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably aiming a bloody machine gun at me. <laughs> Look, I don't mind talking to you, but I don't want it recorded. Okay? Why? Because I don't like the idea of what you're doing, okay? With me. I mean, if you want to expose yourself to everybody, well, that's fine. But I don't want to be involved. You that's said it. you would help me that time we came to the help! It's a different... You said you'd be actually in it. Okay. No, I never said that at all. I have never, ever, ever, ever agreed to be in any filming shit ever. And I don't ever want to. I seem to have hit a dead end with Mum. Uh, I think you have to respect Mary if she doesn't want to be in it. Maybe there could have been a bit more discussion about things like that, but... At the time... At the time, time just raced away. Well, we've started a bit later than we intended, and, um... Well, fuck, I don't know. It's just sort of happening now, really, I guess. <sighs> All right. All right, let's All right. go. See ya. See ya. Have fun. I'm gonna miss you. That's good. That's not good, but that's good in a sense. <sighs> We have a long journey ahead, but I need to start from the very beginning. My parents met and fell in love in far northern Australia and got married soon after that. Together, Mum and Dad built a fishing trawler in my grandparents' backyard. A romantic voyage into what must have been a promising future. Nowadays, Mum and Dad are retired and have horses instead of fish. But back then, it was time to start a family. I was born a big-headed baby girl. I remember a strong sense of joy and wonder about the world. And with my two younger sisters, Sophie and Bonnie, life was one big adventure. So there I was, a happy kid. But when I was five years old, a discovery was made that changed everything. We all start life without any defined sex. At six to eight weeks, biological triggers set us on the path towards male or female. But for some of us, something extraordinary happens. We could be born with male or female looking genitals or somewhere in between or sex chromosomes and internal organs that don't quite match up with how we look externally. There are many different types of intersex, and there could be as many as one intersex baby in every hundred. For some of us, it's picked up at birth. Some of us don't find out until later, or not at all. I didn't start puberty until quite late and I was painfully aware of the exciting changes my girlfriends were going through. I had to stand by as my friends grew breasts, got their periods and got attention from boys. Look at that pretty face. I went to see mum and I said to her in the backyard of our house in Townsville, um, you know, when will I start menstruating? And she said, that I would basically never start menstruating. And I was a bit kind of like, why? And she said that I didn't have a uterus, uh, and so therefore I couldn't get pregnant and I would never menstruate. <laughs> Mum didn't really explain much more than that, but she did say it was something I should keep to myself. Slowly, my behaviour began to change. There was this time at a sleepover with my gang of girls and we tried to each insert a tampon, which I think might be like a fairly girly rite of passage. Why don't we use 
just want to try this. And so everyone went and tried it and they were like, yeah, yeah, it fits, no worries, you know, we're, we're all good. And then I was like, yeah, well, I'll try it. And, you know, I should be right too. And then when I went to do it, it, it didn't work. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go in. At that point, I was like, whoa, there's something much, much, much more wrong with me than not being able to menstruate. I didn't understand why I was such a freak. I lost all interest in school and fell out with my friends. I hated my mother. I hated everyone. Most of all, I hated myself. I'm depressed. <laughs> to top it off, Sophie, my younger sister, had a boyfriend, even though Dad didn't approve. I wasn't talking to Mum at all. Mum and Dad were always busy working anyway. I knew that people knew more about me than I knew about myself, and I had that feeling the whole way along. It just made me feel feel like an, an alien, basically. <laughs> At the end of year 12, my parents decided it was time to tell me everything. Mum took me for a drive and we parked by the beach. And we were both looking out at the beach, not looking at each other, just sort of staring straight ahead. And she sort of said, you've got this condition called testicular feminizing syndrome. And basically that means that you have male chromosomes. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm a boy. I don't know, but I was kind of relieved. It wasn't just some weird thing that happened to me and me alone. Mm -hmm. My condition is now called androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. There's only one of us in every 20,000 male births. My chromosomes are male, and I was born with undescended testes. But my body is resistant to male hormones, and so I developed as female. The doctors said my testes had to be removed, as there was a small chance that they could become cancerous. I went in for surgery just before my first year of university. I was probed because I was such a rare case. I was photographed and displayed like a piece of meat. And after that point in time, I think I just wanted to lose myself for a bit. We all have scars from childhood accidents. The memory of pain begins to fade with the scar, but some scars cut deeper than others. When I think about the scars on my body, the ones that are still raw are more the psychological scars that I live with every day. My self-confidence and my sense of completeness, I'm willing to change that. I want to change that because I want to get on with my life. After my surgery, I told my doctors I wanted to meet other people like me. They said I should give up on the idea. No one would want to out themselves. For nearly 10 years, I didn't feel confident to go looking for others. Finally, I did a search on the internet. Within seconds, I found other people with exactly the same story as me. I found that there are lots of types of intersex, but all of us seem to have so many experiences in common. We've only really talked on the phone but I'm surprised by the level of connection Alicia and I have. Hi. 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 <laughs> Back to the alignment at the same time. <laughs> Thanks. What you doing? I reckon we should go and jump in the pool. I've been hanging out for you guys to arrive. Okay, cool. Oh. <laughs> What do you reckon like about this idea of the documentary that I'm doing, like actually being a little bit more open? Because I, I don't know, like my parents seem to think I'm crazy. 
My parents have thought I was crazy since I was five years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I first said I want to be a girl. <laughs> I was born with congenital adrenal hyperplasia or CAH and also a true intersex condition where I was actually a combination of male and female. The doctors decided they would raise me as male. They cut out my cervix, stitched up the vagina. From an early age, they started giving me hormones to turn me into male. Growing up, I knew well, the whole time I was female. I can remember coming home from school one day and saying to mum, hey mum, am I hermaphrodite? And she just changed the subject straight away. Eventually, I got to be 18, stopped taking testosterone injections, which were called my vitamin pills, and developed breasts. And the moment I started to develop breasts, that was it. That was probably the most exciting day of my life. My first job was as a stripper in King's Cross, where the Spruker used to advertise me as come and see the freak show. We've got a real life hermaphrodite on stage. I actually heard a doctor say the other day that we don't exist because as soon as you're assigned to one gender or the other, you're not, no longer intersexed. Well, you are intersexed your entire life. Do you want to explain how you got the scar? Yeah, it was a homophobic bashing. Somebody hit me in the back of the head with a, well, I believe it was a star picket, an iron bar. People have been aggressive to me in the past. They still are aggressive to me occasionally in the, now. I try and rise above it, try not to get involved in the situation, try to walk away from it if I can. Um, it's made me, I guess, see the ugly side of human nature and something that I don't want to be. So it, it, to, to my advantage, I guess I've riven, risen above it, um, try and go above and beyond um, that aggressive behaviour. It still affects you. I'm impressed by Alicia's resilience. It seems like she's found happiness after everything that she's been through and hasn't had to do it by hiding who she is. Here we go, things are balancing out for you, Sagi. Your perspectives are softening. You might even find other people more receptive and responsive to your ideas. It's amazing what a difference the soft, soft approach can have on others. Alicia's generosity is inspiring and gives me confidence to keep going. Discovering that your intersex can be an isolating experience. And because we never talked about it in our family, I grew up not knowing that my sister Bonnie also has AIS. Ready? <laughs> Bonnie and I went through the same tough times during adolescence, but we never shared any of those experiences. We were separated by age and the family secret. Now, as an adult, Bonnie expresses her rage on stage. Anger's kicking it in the intersex world. Like, I really deal with my anger in most situations, like in personal confrontations, stuff like that, really well. But all it takes is one trip to a doctor surgery and treating me in that particular way, and I'm furious. Furious! Just so furious. Bonnie found out about our condition when she was around 11 years old and had surgery soon after to remove her testes. I actually remember it, like the way that it exists in my memory is that like I went in for a hernia um, operation, but when I actually look back at that, that's what I was told to tell everyone else. So obviously I just started believing what I was saying all the time to people that I was having a hernia operation at that you know, to fix a hernia and... But no, what they did is they, like it was my guy had my testes removed. Yeah. So what did they tell me? I don't know, I was like, I was, I was quite young and I, I think there was a bit of a trauma that was involved with it, you know, like I certainly have a huge scar, physical scar. It was kind of exciting. It was this thing I was the center of attention there was this strange thing going on. I felt like I was special. I always knew I was special. But like I was really special. It's like so special that they wanted a bit of me. I disappeared for one summer. I remember people asking me about my holiday and having to make up some lies or something like this, some lies. 
After being examined and operated on, they decided that they wanted to bring in 10 student nurses to stare at my fanny whilst they stuck their fingers in me and stuff like that. But yeah, I farted and laughed. And then Dr. McGuck went over and like um, washed his hands like distastefully. So I think I got my own back. I was pretty much told that I had an abnormal body from a very early age by medical officials and my parents and stuff like that, you know. And at the same time, I was offered actually no healthy model of what a real body was like, you know, what is a normal body. The idea of normal is, is in flux. Nothing in nature is normal. And we're a complete example of that. I'm a bit fucking worried, Phoebe, that we've got to drive so far and film for like 16 hours today. Like, I think it's fucking highly unreasonable. When Bonnie and I get in a bad mood, we basically stonewall each other. We need to spend time together without any pressure. <laughs> I like sort of Dorothy's shoes, but they're much too small. We both share a love of op shops. There's something cool about looking for treasure amongst society's rejects. What you filming for? Oh, I'm for school. Or? Yeah, I sort of. I'm, no, it's sort of a documentary that we're putting together. Yeah. About um, about people with intersex conditions, actually. Oh. Do you know what that is, or? Could you explain, please. People who are born with um, perhaps both genders, both male and female, in the same bodies. I guess hermaphrodites is another word. Okay, no, I understand better. Yeah, it's actually a personal story. But it's a bit embarrassing to talk about it, but yeah, yeah anyway. I think um, it's about what you're doing. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, Thank you. There should be more young people like you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In a way, it would be easy to stay anonymous. After all, most people don't even know we exist. But it's fun to be more daring, to stick out from the crowd. You got the charges? What do you mean? I'm just, just wondering if you like got them all, that's all. Well, I never touched them. We're about to meet with Tony and Andy. G'day, g'day. Hey, Phoebe, what's that, you fluffy merkin? <laughs> My <laughs> merkin. She could be fashioned into one, I suppose. Andy and Tony are old friends. I met them online soon after I started my cyber search for others. Tony was raised as a girl, but he began testosterone treatment a few years ago. For me, it was never about proving that I'm male. It was a self-discovery. Um, I wanted to see who I would have actually been had doctors not interfered with me. Um, it was quite clear within you know, a couple of months of starting testosterone treatment mm -hmm. that uh, I was supposed to have been male and that my body would have virilised uh, quite a lot naturally uh, had they not removed my testes and did all that sort of thing. People ask me where I went to school and I still mention the, <laughs> tell them the name of the local girls' school and, and you know, some people might be frightened to, to, do that, to do that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not, and I just explain to people, and they say, isn't that a girl's school? I say, oh, yeah, it is, but uh, I was a girl at the time, and, you know, because I was brought up for this, for this reason and all that sort of thing, and they're like, oh, OK, cool. But I just love this community so much. The last thing I wanted to do is, because of my condition and the way that it was mistreated, that I would have to, you know, be banished and hide about my history and all that. No, I wasn't going to do that. And this is this is the first house my family owned in Australia. This, this one just here. This was my grandmother's home. I always say if it's going to go for sale, I want to buy it. I feel I could learn a few lessons from Tony on being honest and fearless. Tony's a very funny guy. He's just good fun. His view is you have to live your own life. Who cares what other people think? Is that another cigarette? Are you my wife? Yes. <laughs> Stop it. Andy has the same condition as Bonnie and me, but was raised as a boy. I found out when I was 30, 
And I was just pissed off. I was just so, that's the only way to describe it. I was just angry and really, really pissed off that I hadn't been told. Tony's been a huge influence on me to be who I am. To me, Andy and Tony make a very cute pair. The tall, blonde, former army engineer with the Maltese pocket dynamo. But Tony assures me they're just friends. He's not ready for a relationship. If it was about intimacy, I probably would have stayed as Antoinette because Antoinette had a lot more intimate encounters than uh, Tony has. But I can't even imagine at this stage having a full-on relationship with someone. I need to be able to, you know, be with someone that's comfortable with all, with all of that. Um, but I'm not comfortable with all of that exactly yet myself with, with what I have and what I don't have. Um, yeah, so the intimacy side of things is, yeah. Mm. Don't know if that'll ever happen, but, you know, mm. yeah, it's something that I'll have to deal with. Mm. When I was growing up, the idea of intimacy freaked me out too. After the surgery, I don't think I was ready to think about my future. Both Bonnie and I were trying to work out what had happened to our lives. Well, actually, I was like a um, quite a unsure and afraid. Like, didn't like had a had, had sort of had my my root cut to what was naturally me. I became like a master of like of lying, master of fantasy and creation of reality. I was also searching for ways to escape who I really was. I was alone. I was very lonely and uh, in, at university in another city and I was bulimic. The people I was meeting, they were into all sorts of psychedelics, so I was just from some kind of weird nightmare place. What was your idea of me at that time? Uh, I thought you, I thought Bonnie, you were very together compared to me kind of thing. I just thought I, you know, I can remember that I, th I had a sense that you looked up to me, like, you know, and that I should be a really good example to you. But like, you know, my world felt like it was falling apart, whereas you seemed to be okay. I mean, now I probably would not have said that at all if I had been looking at you as like a 13 year old who's too skinny, like out of control. Well, you're right, I really did look up to you. And your idea of hell was my idea of heaven. <laughs> In some ways, it was fun and a chance to have the adolescence that I thought I'd missed out on. I was experimenting socially and sexually. Somehow I stumbled into a few relationships, but I was terrified. Maybe I wouldn't be able to physically do this to have sex. And all the doctors that saw me seemed to confirm this as well. With pain, Bonnie and I remember when we were prescribed dilators to lengthen our vaginal canals with the aid of tight, stretchy Bombay Bloomer underwear. I actually was extremely envious that you got these quite fashionable things that you're supposed to shove up your mood to stretch it to get you ready for the prospective partner that would come later on in life. I had these lovely white cylindrical, um, oh, they look sort of like this. Actually, incredibly much like this. And only they were really sharply speared at the end. Why give us pieces of plastic that have absolutely no representation or look nothing like a, you know, like anything sexual in order to train us, in order to act like normal sexual beings. Like, what do you want me to do? Go around making out with washing machines and shit like that? <laughs> After dilation, I was prepared for sex to be an utter disaster. I fully expected my lovers to run screaming freak from my boudoir. But when I lost my virginity, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised. I tried out a number of partners and arrangements, but I tended towards serial monogamy. <laughs> 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 
Finally, I met someone who I felt completely at home with. James and I took the plunge. After only six months of knowing each other, we decided to get married. It was love and lust at first sight. I think within the first two weeks of being together, we kind of knew we're just so into each other and we're like shagging every opportunity we can get. It didn't really matter where it was. I didn't always tell my whole story to people I hooked up with. But with James, I decided to be honest from the start. Once I actually found out about what AIS was, I was confronted with the fact that I, might, I thought I might be gay myself. Because genetically you're a male. But I think you can fall in love with the person and whether that person's male or female doesn't really matter. So I remember thinking, if this person has been through a lot like this, then they could pretty much handle most things in life. Let's just go for it and live with what comes. I think that's our philosophy, really. Falling in love and marrying James was a whirlwind. Something I thought would never happen to me. But we had to face early on how my condition would affect our lives together. I can remember you said something like, you know, if, if we if we're together, then you should know that I can't have children and that we'd never have children. And I was thinking at the time, whoa, this is like, this is like just going way beyond where I thought like a, a first night together kind of thing would go. I'd never imagined a little me running around. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd always imagined being an uncle or, um, yeah, uh, yeah, so it didn't... It, didn't, I didn't fear not having my own children. It's probably more been recently that I'm thinking about that sort of stuff more. And you know, I think it's okay to provide a good home to somebody that might not necessarily have one. James and I start the process of becoming a family, looking at adoption as our first option for parenthood. I was bringing up regarding the invitation to express interest. Okay. While this is the very early start of a long process, okay, it's one we've begun in earnest. Bye. Done. For everyone else, having a child seems so easy. Lots of my friends are pregnant, and I feel a pang of loss watching them. And its feet are kind of... What's it like to have a life inside of you? But there is still excitement for us. James rings me with good news. We've been accepted onto the register to adopt a child. He read it beforehand, and yeah, he read it beforehand. He was pretending to open it up, and oh my god, I just can't believe it. I'm happy imagining the future and I'm starting to feel comfortable with who I am. I'm beginning to understand my sister better too. It's part of the reason I wanted her to come with me on this trip. To make up for lost time, I suppose. But covering this many Ks in the car is taking its toll. Oh, you should see the colour of the guts on the licence plate. That's disgusting, Bonnie. Just turn the fucking camera off. I think that we're asses to each other, Phoebe. Huh? I think, like, you know, I want you in my life as like a loving, supporting human being, not some fucking person I want to run away from half the time, like... Because you wouldn't be on my ass if we weren't doing this together, do you know? No one's on your ass, though, Bonnie, normally. Well, who... Why do I need someone on my ass? To get your shit together. My shit's fine. My shit's exactly where I've left it. Such asses. <laughs> We're never gonna let it die. <laughs> Just gonna sit here and keep on bitching about each other to each other and trying to find some way out for all of eternity. This is, this is a really weird sort of life film mediated existence. I've had really hard different times with it. Like, 
being behind the camera, in front of the camera, sister, camera operator, professional, professional, <laughs> driving, humorous, not too humorous. No. While I'm on this journey to meet intersex people, there are some family issues I need to confront on the way. We've come to see our sister Sophie. Sophie doesn't have AIS. She can have babies, but she is a carrier of the AIS gene. As a kid, I always saw Sophie as the bossy one the middle child trying to assert herself in any way possible. Sophie, are you hungry, Sophie? Now, Sophie works as a stylist for TV and magazines. Even though we were close, I'm not sure Sophie's even aware of what happened to Bonnie and me as teenagers. I think when you and Bonnie found out, I can remember um, not being told. Uh, and I think somebody, you had told your friends at school, um, some of them, but I didn't know, and I actually found out through one of your friends rather than from you or Bonnie or mum or dad. I just remember that, um, that we weren't allowed to tell anyone, that it was really secret. I guess once the secret was established, that it was then very difficult yeah. to break the pattern. To, to break, break out of, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. It's like how do you talk about something that you've never actually talked about? How do you start that conversation? And so you're a carrier um, of the gene as well. You know, like, how did you find that out? I don't know how old I was, but I remember having the test done and then mum taking me aside and telling me that, you know, I could have children, and, uh, but I was a carrier. And then if I wanted to uh, have, when I had children one day and if I didn't want to pass on the genetic, you know, defect or whatever that she was calling it at the time, that I could have a test and then I could, you know, choose whether I wanted to have a child with AIS or not. Would you have a child with AIS? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there would be no, like, I mean, they're no different to, to normal people. Mm -hmm. Normal, it's the same. For me, this conversation is a breakthrough. I can imagine the idea of passing on our condition could be a little scary for anyone considering parenthood. Oh my God. When a baby's born that's different, parents are faced with an overwhelming decision. Modern medics have experimented on our bodies with surgeries and hormones on a quest to make us all the same. And these days, with prenatal screening, some babies with intersex may not be born at all. I think about mum and dad and the decisions they had to make when we were kids. I realised I can't pressure them into talking, but I can still hope. There's one more important stop I want to make while I'm on this journey. Hiya. That's good. Yeah, it's nice to see you too. It's nice to see you. It has been a while. Yeah. Chris is my, he was my photography teacher in high school. So it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I know. And I didn't, and we didn't know that there was like that connection. I suppose that no. that we had a, both had this intersex condition. I suppose. No, and I'm even more surprised to hear that you both are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Well, I've joined the club. <laughs> Chris was one of my most influential teachers, and it was a total shock for me to find out recently that he is XXY also intersex. I was really nervous coming here, actually. It's the first time I've sort of connected with someone who, I, you know, has a connection to my past when it was all a big dark secret. So I was still sort of really finding myself, so. Oh, well, all I remember is uh, basically that you were a bit of a tear away, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Chris as a wild-haired free spirit at school. I don't think he made a point of concealing that he's intersex, but I guess we all have sides to ourselves 
that not everyone sees. <laughs> now, I've got something to show you. I was, I was, how should I say, I was looking around, I tried to find some of the photos I took when I was doing your course. And yeah, this is a little self-portrait I took. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I was a bit obsessed with that whole kind of feminine mystique at the time. And um, I had this as well. This is actually, do you remember this? Do you want to read it out aloud? Okay, welcome to the course. This is the beginning of your life in a little black box of fascinating illusions interpreted out of magic moments. Using the light of day or the flash of electronic inspiration, the flood of power bent through glass and poured out like an alchemist upon the acetates to reveal the elixir of a certain and extraordinary life waiting your command, my goodness. Some of the lecturers thought I was quite mad. <laughs> <laughs> I was brought up in a boys' boarding school from the age of eight to my 18th birthday. I, I realised that my testes were atrophying and I was starting to develop perfectly normal female breasts. Um, as a result of that, I got mercilessly teased. Um, I remember one particular occasion where I was physically picked up by about ten blokes and shoved into the latrines and rolled in, 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 the, in the piss trough. And I thought, well, if I ever get the courage to do something about this, I will. But um, in those days, it was extremely difficult. And... Whoops, I can see myself reflecting back and I can see the tears rolling in, coming up, um, even talking about it. But what I did is um, I ended up having a bilateral mastectomy, not because I wanted to, but by the sheer public pressure of being different and um, thinking why should someone have to go to those extremes to fit into society no one should have to. Your story is very poignant for me because I had the kind of surgery to make me more female in some respects. I'm used to being just a little bit cautious, a little bit, what do I tell this person about myself? What, what do you think about this film? Like, like what, do, you think I'm, do you think it's a mad errand or...? No, why should it be? Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, no, of course not. I think it will achieve something that you could not have otherwise imagined. I think it will release you. Well, I hope so. Have a good. Lots of different things, but at the same time. I can only imagine what it would have been like to have these kinds of conversations when I was growing up, instead of feeling like I was all on my own. I now know that I need to return home and face up to those closest to me. Budgie? <laughs> it's good to be home, and James and I have a lot to celebrate. <laughs> we start looking for a house to buy. What do you reckon of the house? I think it's very nice. It's a scary step. But we need to look financially secure if we have any chance of adopting a child. We're now in the assessment stage of the adoption process. There are lots of hoops to jump through, and it could take years. But it's exciting all the same. Do you think you could uh, get a closer? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Bonnie and I are taking time out from each other after the trip. She started seeing a new guy, and it just reminds me how different we are. We just generally hooked up um, almost instantaneously. It's hard to say because, you know, um, never try and overanalyze the, the extra magical moments, you know? We could spend a lifetime trying to explain the particular moment as uh, the way, like, um, you know, a high speed car racer would spend several hours describing the few moments of a car crash. Bonnie's left to go to Melbourne. She just left in the middle of the night and rung me up a couple of days after being on the road, 
saying, go around and pick up all my stuff. It feels weird walking around Bonnie's place. It's like a bomb hit. I wonder whether there are any survivors. Meanwhile, I have some stuff of my own to sort out. James and I visit his mother to tell her about the progress of the adoption and to reveal why I can't have babies. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Congratulations, Phoebe. Congratulations, Jones. Faye has rheumatoid arthritis, so James grew up with a mother with a disability. I think she will understand where I'm coming from. It's like a genetic condition that was sort of inherited throughout the family. It's quite complicated to explain, but it means that I was chromosomally actually male in the, in the, in the uterus sort of thing, but it didn't have any effect on my body, so I just grew up as, a, as, as, as feminine sort of thing. Yeah. You look pretty feminine. <laughs> so there was no choosing. I just looked like a little baby girl when I was born sort of thing. And... Um, pretty ready to be a boy. <laughs> I know that James always, you know, wanted his own children, but if that was more important to him than you, then he would never have married you. I look at it this way. If you can give some poor little baby a chance at life, you know, and if you're going to do that, you have to remember that they are your children. They're not somebody else's, they're yours. And you have to do the absolute best that you can do for that child. I notice that James's behaviour is changing. James and I have been fighting quite a lot and he's revealed some things to me lately that I didn't really know he had on his plate or that he was feeling that way. What are you doing? Sorry. No, no, come on, turn it off. James! Stop it, baby, please. Yeah, there was a meltdown moment, I suppose. One of the reasons I'd been aggressive was because, you know, I had been feeling weird about not having my own biological children. That was the build-up of a whole bunch of stuff that had been probably coming since, since the birth of my sister's son. And you're not the only one that goes through crap because you've got a condition. You know, there are other indirect effects on the people around you because of that condition. We're having to go through the heaviest moments of our, probably our life together and from the sense that we're not having our own children. And, but I'm sure that that, in time, just become another moment in the past. I just hope we just keep doing interesting things and I think maybe adoption is part of that. A long-term relationship is generally extraordinary these days. So that's, that'd be kind of cool. Um, yeah, I think Would whatever comes up, just be open to it, see what happens. A few weeks later, I get a letter from Mum. She says that she's willing to talk. This changes everything. I ask Bonnie to come back and finish our journey. the camera as always. <laughs> you know, it was funny when, um, when you went away, like it was so sudden actually, and we were all a bit sh shocked by that. It just seemed like um, that things couldn't change. Do you know, like after so much time's gone by, we still reverted back to these uh, roles that we've adapted. I suppose both of us were stuck. Everyone has their moments. Everyone has their moments of insanity. Everyone has their moments of, um, of doubt. James, Bonnie and I make the trip north for a family reunion. Thanks for coming back for me. <laughs> Thank you.
是米哈。<笑>
and I'm home. It's only been a short visit, and I'm not sure if mum and dad realise how much it has meant to me. But it's good to know some things will never change. Oh, uh, please turn that bloody thing mom, off. Mum, just ignore it. Like, I can't. You must become a, you must become a bit Look, more detached from it. It's your choice. You, you people I don't own. choose. I'm just choosing to support Phoebe and what she wants to do, you know? So, what did you do? Huh? Nothing. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Bye. Thanks for the childhood. <laughs> see ya. Did you see Dad's face? <laughs> <laughs> I feel so lucky to have the family that I have. Bye. Somehow, taking this crazy journey and bringing a camera along with me has made me brave enough to confront my family and myself. But I could never have done it without the support of James and Bonnie. I guess when I think about what we were like as kids, I don't know what I would say to myself, like, you know, now that it would say about me then, just that don't be so tough on yourself. Don't be so tough on mum. Do you think I let you down? Or do you think that like... No, you can't be there to, to weather every bump that a person could have. Do you know what I mean? Like I, and if you did, then I would, my, my muscles would atrophy, you know, like, and I'd be like totally helpless and dependent upon you. Not the strong individual that you need in order to be a, com a companion or a, a good friend, you know, like. So you're not angry anymore? I'm everything, man. <laughs> Can't say I'm not angry. You can piss me off if you want to. You can piss me <laughs> off if you want to. <laughs> so easy to do. <laughs> this feels like a good place to end the film. But there's one more surprise ahead. Okay, just a typical Sunday afternoon here with James. And uh, yeah, not much to report other than playing with our new baby. She's like, are you gonna get me out of here or what, Dad? It's been a long wait since we registered to adopt almost as long as it's taken to complete this film. Now that she's here, like any new parents, we're absolutely shitting ourselves. I can't wait to show her the world. I'd like her to be proud of who she is and how she came into our lives. And from what I can tell about her at this early stage, I reckon she's ready to take the world head on. <laughs>